Craig here, and this is Practical 4 for Module 1, The Solid Earth. So this practical is on volcanoes and magma bubbles and their relationship to magma viscosity. So what we'll be doing in this prac is running a lab experiment. So the resources which we're going to be using, which I've already set up and used for you, are a bunch of beakers, measuring cylinders, marbles, glucose syrup, which is very messy, uh, some rulers, a stopwatch, which I'm going to have embedded in the video for you, and very importantly, a scoop. Um, we're also using air pumps, hose bubble makers to actually make bubbles in our glucose syrup solutions. Uh, we'll be recording everything on our camera so that you guys have access to recorded video of the experiments going on. Um, and lastly, if you have some laptops to help you prepare your lab report at the end. So, first off, viscosity. Viscosity is the critical parameter for fluids. It describes how fluids flow. So for earth sciences, it describes how magmas flow. It defines the shape of the volcanoes that form from those lavas. Um, it also determines their explosiveness. So it's really critically important for understanding how dangerous a volcano is going to be. And it also, in case you're interested, the viscosity of the interior of the earth determines the speed of tectonic plates. The viscosity, the way to think of it, is it's like a friction for fluids. It determines how sluggish a fluid moves when a force is applied to it. Well, strictly, we don't really apply a force to fluids. It's like poking your finger at something and pushing it along. We normally talk about a pressure or even more generally a stress, which is like pushing a fluid from all different directions. So when you apply a stress to a fluid, it will flow. And how fast it flows depends on its viscosity. So... Very viscous fluids, like for instance honey or molasses, are very thick and gloopy and they flow much more slowly than less viscous fluids, like for instance water, or even air has a viscosity, it's just very low. So in this practical, we're going to undertake a couple of experiments to understand how viscosity controls magma bubbles. Now this is really important for our science, because as we've talked about in the lectures, some volcanoes get very, very explosive, and the ones that do have tended to build up a lot of pressure in the subsurface because they can't let gas or magma escape very easily because their magmas are too viscous. So rhyolite volcanoes are an example of that. So if they can't lose their bubbles, the pressure builds up and the volcano might explode. So in order to address this, we're not allowed to play with real magma, so we're going to play with a classic fluid dynamics liquid, which is glucose syrup. Um, and we're going to measure the viscosity of four different mixtures of glucose syrup and water, and then see how the bubbles behave in each of these different viscosity fluids. So to set the scene and to give you a bit of a cartoon of why this is interesting, this, for instance, is a low viscosity magma, which has a low silica content and low glass. So this is a bit example of somewhere like Hawaii, which is erupting basalt. And it'll just be slowly flowing down the side of it, forming this very gentle slope, a shield volcano hitting the water down here. If you had a similar thing, a basalt with high gas, you could get things like lava fountains and whatnot forming, but they tend to flow down the side pretty smoothly once they get down slope. For a high silica low gas, you might get a strata or composite volcano forming, which is much more steep sided, builds up a lot of topography. And then a high silica magma, like a rhyolite with a lot of gas, you'd form a similar structure volcano, but you could get explosive eruptions associated with it, which of course are the most dangerous kinds of eruptions that we want to know about. So. For many of you, um, you may have done experiments in basic science classes before and you're familiar with the methodology, in which case this will be a gentle remind you, but for a good fraction of the class, this may be the first and possibly the last time you've actually worked through the formal approach of setting up a lab experiment. So we're going to treat this like we would a classical lab experiment and go through the basic scientific method of generating a hypothesis testing that hypothesis, and then writing up the practical. And of course, the discussion section of this practical is actually going to be your assignment one, so make sure you have a crack at it. So we're going to do a fully referenced lab report at the end to also develop your science writing and referencing skills. So step one in all of this is generate a hypothesis. So we've read and been told in lectures perhaps that uh, explosive eruptions occur because gas pressure builds up, and that may happen because the magmas are very viscous. So 
We want to test that and we have to think of what then is a testable hypothesis, something we can approach and say something sensible on. So our hypothesis might be, for instance, that high viscosity fluids slow bubbles down and let them grow bigger. So let's see if we can test this. Now generally, at this point, you'd include a bit of a background to the problem. You'd maybe describe previous work that has been done on it, why it's important. But you can think about all of this background material for your lab report. To test the hypothesis though, the next step generally would be to measure the viscosity of the fluid and then look at the bubbles in it. So in order to do that, we're gonna move on to our methodology. Now I have a video associated with this, but what I'll do is I'll run through the written part of the Prackbook methodology and then we'll move on to the videos um, when we try and constrain the results. So the approach we're using anyway is a classic approach from the British fluid dynamicist, George Stokes. Uh, and he worked out that you could calculate the viscosity of a fluid, which was fairly viscous, by dropping a ball in it, something like a marble, and then looking at how slowly that sunk. And for a highly viscous fluid, it would, it would sink very, very slowly. And for a low viscosity fluid like water, the marble would sink very fast. So if you knew some things like gravity, which is here, the density of the marble and the density of the fluid, the radius of the marble itself, and then if you could calculate the velocity at which it was sinking by, you could work out the viscosity of the fluid. So we're gonna use this equation to do this. Now, you'll notice I scratched a few things out. This is because my marbles went walkabout from the lab, so I've had to buy some more this year. So I've worked out the density of the marbles and their radius independently, and I'll put those um, bits of information up as I'm talking now, so you guys can scribble down or come back to those density and radius calculations a little further on. And of course, as the density of the fluids, I usually give this to you, but again, I'll rework them out for the new fluids that we've mixed in the lab for this year. So I'll include the picture with the list of all the new densities on it just here as well. So your methodology, once you have this information, then would be to fill a cylinder up with the fluids, so I've actually set four up for you already. Um, then we wanna make two marks on the side of the measuring cylinder. And we wanna miss the top of the fluid a bit to avoid the splash, and we wanna miss the bottom a bit because the marble slows down when it hits the descent. So we're gonna measure somewhere in the middle. And I'm actually gonna make them two marks 10 centimeters apart, and we'll look at how long it takes to sink between those marks. So we'll measure that distance, and for us this distance D is going to be 10 centimetres, or 0 0.1 metres. Then someone drops a marble in the fluid, and someone else will measure it. So normally we do this in the lab with a stopwatch and a ruler. Um, you're going to have the video at this time, and I'll be embedding a stopwatch in the video so you can measure the exact time of descent. The fifth step would then be using that time of descent and the distance to calculate the velocity, and we'll do it in a table just here. And then once we've got the velocity, we can use the viscosity formula here. We have all this information and we can calculate the viscosity and that would go in this column here. Now a key point here I note is we wanna repeat this. We don't just wanna do it once. We have a lot of noise in these sort of, uh, in these sort of experiments. So to minimize that, we wanna take an average. So what I've actually done in the videos is repeat the drop experiment three times. And what you can do even is um, write down the three times in here and work out the average time and use that to calculate the average velocity and average viscosity based on that. So this then takes us into this results section, which you guys will need to have a look at the videos for. I'll put them up in a sec, but before we get to that, the main point is the things we want in this table, this is the distance the marble's falling. So I've marked out 10 centimeter markers on the measuring tube, so you'll put 0 0.1 meters in here. This will be the time it takes for the marble to sink, so you'll write down your time measured from the video in here. I've got three videos, so watch all three and then calculate the average time. Then you can use our formula here to calculate your velocity. Your viscosity of the fluids I've given you already uh, in that little picture, and I'll put it up again just now in case you forgot where it was on YouTube. And once you've written down your viscosities for the different colored fluids, uh, sorry, your uh, densities of the different colored fluids here, you calculate your viscosities of the fluids rather using this formula. 
and you put them into this column here. Right, once you've got those, we want to make a graph. And we want to calculate viscosity versus velocity on the graph paper. Now we have to have a think about which one's the x and which one's the y here. Um, normally the x parameter would be the independent variable, the thing on which the other variable depends. Now it's a little topsy-turvy here because we use velocity to calculate viscosity, but normally, I mean, strictly speaking, the viscosity is setting how fast the velocity is. So in this case, the viscosity in terms of the material point of view is actually your independent parameter and your velocity here would depend on it. But I'm okay if you have to either way in this one because we did the working in an opposite sense to that. The main point here is though, label your axes. So put down what it is. Is it velocity? Is it viscosity? Write it down and write your units on the axes as well. Include a plot title. You should always have a plot title. And lastly, you should also have a caption here to describe to the reader what is going on in your figure. So it might say something like, Figure 1, the relationship between velocity and measured viscosity for a marble drop experiment using four different viscosity fluids. And that would explain to me what these four different points you plotted up here would be. Right, I'll leave that to you. Let's go have a look at some of the videos now of the setup and we'll return to the bubble section after we've done our marble drop experiment. So what we're doing today is we want to test the hypothesis that different style magnets with different viscosities will actually behave differently in terms of how they release bubbles. Now this is a critical application for volcanoes because as we know, some volcanoes with very runny lavas don't tend to build up pressure, they don't create big bubbles, the lavas just flow gently downstream, they don't explode. Whereas some other volcanoes, say up to more rhyolitic style with very thick viscous lava, they tend to build up lots and lots of pressure that don't flow easily, and as a result, those volcanoes quite often explode. So how bubbles escape from the magma is critical in understanding how dangerous a volcano is. Now they don't let me play with lava in the lab, unfortunately, even though you guys are doing this yourselves now, it's still frowned upon. So instead of lava, we have a substitute which is glucose syrup. So I've set up along the bench a number of different glucose syrup mixtures which have been colored with a little bit of food coloring. And what we're going to do today is we're going to first work out the viscosity of these glucose mixtures. Now, in order to do that, we're going to use an old law that a British fluid dynamicist, George Stokes, worked up. The equation is in your notes. Now, the things we need to know in the equation of G, that's gravity, we also need to know the density of a ball, we drop through it and measure how fast the ball sinks, that will tell us the viscosity. But the density of the ball is critical. I'm using a marble and I've calculated its density very precisely when I'm giving that to you in a photograph in this video. So we have the density of the marble and we need to know the density of each fluid. So the way in which I work that out is I mix the mixtures together, I knew the weight of the measuring tube and then I measured the final weight of the measuring tube on the scales to get how much the fluid weighed. Then I know exactly how much fluid is in here from the, from the uh, measures on the measuring tube. So I've got the volume, then I can work out its density, which is mass divided by volume. I've done all the hard work there for you. I'm gifting you that. What you guys are going to have to do, though, is work out the viscosity. So you can see in that equation, we need the radius of the marbles, which I'll give you, the densities, which I'll give you, and then we need to work out the velocity, and that's the bit where we're going to actually do this experiment. So, the way in which we're going to do this in the prankbook, if you have a look, is we're going to measure out a distance on the flask that the ball has to sink through. In our case, I've made a marking on the flask at the top and at the bottom that equates to 10 centimeters. Now, the reason for doing it kind of midways when I drop the marble in, it'll splash at the start, it'll take a little while to put it up speed, so I want to eliminate that. And when it gets me down the bottom, the fluid's kind of squishing away, the marble will slow down, and I don't want to capture that. So I have 10 centimeters sort of in the middle here, measuring the free fall of that marble through that viscous fluid. So I've got my D here for each of them, it's actually going to be 10 centimeters. And if you look at your table, that's what we put in this first one 10 centimeters is 0.1 meters. Next thing we're going to do is work out our time that the marble takes to fall. Now, 
I'm going to include a timer in the videos for this. You can also use your little video scale if you're watching on YouTube to see when the marble first hits here and when the marble finally passes here. We're going to do this for each individual fluid and we're going to do it three times. You guys can average the amount of times, put it in there and work out the average velocity. Then if you have the density of the fluid, you can use the equation there to work out your viscosity and fill that into that column now. So, without further ado, let's get into actually dropping the marbles in the fluids to work out what their density is. Recording. Right, so this is green fluid marble experiment run number one. I'm going to drop it in and you have to measure how fast it drops from this line down to that line, which is a distance of 10 centimeters. Here we go. And it's hit that line, it's falling, and boom. Right, now of course we don't want to rely on the results of just one fall. So let's do that a couple of times. I'm going to drop the marble in again now, and measure it again. And there. And there. Right, record that time as well. And I'll do it one third time. And here we go. Hit the line, and down it goes, and it, boom, hit the line. Right, that's three drops of the marble through there, over a distance of 10 centimeters. The average time it took in each of those three runs is what you record in your column. This is the marble drop experiment for fluid number two, which is our red fluid. Now I'm gonna drop the marble in. It will sink this distance of 10 centimeters and you'll need to record the time it takes for the marble to descend past those markers. Let's start now. Slowly, slowly getting there. And just hit the first marker. I'm looking at the leading edge of the marble here. This is, this is exciting science. It's descending very slowly through this fluid. And the leading edge is about to hit the line now. And now the trailing edge just passed the line. Okay, I'll retrieve the marble and we'll drop it in again. Okay, here we go for marble drop in the red fluid number two. It's just a little stuck. <laughs> okay, here comes the marble. It's descended past the first marker. And it's about to descend past the second marker now. And the back end of descend past the second marker now. Okay, I will retrieve the marble and we'll do one last very slow descent. Okay, commencing marble drop number three. And here comes the marble. Oh, I'm getting such a mess on me now. Oh, the marble's sliding down the side. Here it comes now. Passing the first marker.
just passing the second marker, leading edge now, and the trailing edge will be passing the second marker now. And I have completely discussed it. Looking at Siri <laughs> missing out on me. <laughs>This is marble drop experiment on fluid number three, the yellow fluid. This distance again is 10 centimeters and I'm dropping the marble in now. Leading edge passing and leading edge passing second marker now. Okay, retrieving the marble for drop number two. And here it comes. And marble passing now. Okay, retrieving the marble for drop number three. I can see it. There we go. Okay, dropping the marble in now. Here it comes. And passing the second marker now. Okay, that was the yellow fluid. Alright, this is the marble drop in the blue fluid. It does have a few bubbles in it before because we're running the aerator, so we'll try and get it on the side. You can see here it comes now. Alright, marble is descending in the blue fluid just there. Its leading edge is about to pass the marker now. You'll get a little clearer as it propagates down past those air bubbles. Leading edge just there, and here it comes. It's about to hit the second mark right now. Trailing edge will hit that second mark right now. Okay, I'll retrieve the marble for the second drop. Okay, and I'll try and drop it on the leading side again for visibility. Okay, here comes the marble onto the front side of the measuring tube. And it's beginning its very slow descent. It will be in frame in a second. Bear with us, it's coming. There it is. Alright, leading edge passing now. It's just gone past the first marker. Trailing edge is passing the marker now. We could probably get a coffee while we wait for this to sink. Marble is still sinking. Marble is sinking very slow. The advantage of watching this online is you can fast forward. Marble is still sinking. Okay, marble's approaching the marker now. That was the leading edge. And the trailing edge will pass the marker now. Okay, that was drop number two. We will retrieve the marble for a third fairly slow drop. Okay, here we go. We've drop number three of the marble into the blue fluid. Okay, marble has commenced its descent slowly. It is approaching the marker, leading edge approaching it now. Trailing edge approaching now.
Marble is approaching the second marker, leading edge passing now. Trailing edge passing now. So we've just finished our viscosity experiments and we've determined the viscosity of the four fluids by dropping a marble through it a number of times and taking an average. Now if you're doing a simple experiment at this point you'd often move on to your discussion section next and your conclusions but we aren't actually finished our results yet. So we know the viscosities of the fluids but what we really want to know is how those viscosities affect the behavior of bubbles in the different fluids. So we're going to move on to phase two now which is looking at magma bubbles. So a methodology for this would be uh, make sure the beakers are filled back up which they are and make sure the marbles are taken out and washed and put away, uh, which I've done. Um, the next part is you have a fix, we initially said graph paper, we've got a ruler today which we're going to affix to the beaker for a scale to allow you to measure the size of the bubbles. Then we're going to um, have an air pump connected via a pipe to an air stone, and we're going to insert that into the beaker and then we're going to switch it on to start a bubble flow. Now all the air pumps are on the same setting, they're putting out the same amount of air, the air, bubble, the air stones are exactly the same, so it's a fairly controlled experiment, the only real difference is the viscosity of the fluid that's going through. So we're going to let the bubbles start, and then we're going to take a couple of still photos, or in your case I'm going to have the movies for you, you can pause it at any time and try and measure the size of the bubbles against the ruler, which is held up against the measuring flask, and also the number of bubbles within a 10 centimeter interval as well to try and get the bubble density. And then once we've measured those bubbles density and the size of the bubbles, we're actually gonna plot them up as well on a bit of graph paper. So here's a little uh, table again that we want you guys to fill out, fill out. So you've got your fluid viscosities, we worked that out from the last experiment for each of the four different colors. Now for those four different colors I want you guys to put in your average bubble size, so you might have to measure a few bubbles and take an average of them, and also the average bubble density per 10 centimeter interval. So look at where the black markers are on the measuring tube and count the number of bubbles within that interval. Right, and then at the end we're going to plot uh, up our results. We're going to plot the viscosity against the bubble size. So here it's quite clear the viscosity is the independent variable, it goes on the x-axis, and the bubble size is the dependent variable, it goes on the y-axis. Again, when you do these sorts of plots, don't forget to put a title on here. Um, label your axes, put the numbers here, and also put what we're reading off the axis and units. And then also don't forget to put a figure caption down the bottom describing what this figure is about to someone who might be reading this work. Right, that's what we're going to be putting in our, in our lab book. Let's go now and have a look at what the bubbles actually look like in these fluids. So at this part of the prac, we've measured the viscosity of the fluid already and what we're going to work out is how that viscosity affects the dynamics of bubbles in it. So for that we have this very fancy piece of equipment which is an aquarium air pump. We've set them all in the same low setting and we have an aerator here which we will descend into the bottom of the tube. Now these will all pump out a similar airflow in each of the containers I'll turn it on now, and what we want to be able to measure is both the number of bubbles in this 10 centimeter gap, the size of the bubbles, and I will put up a ruler next to it so you can have some sort of measure against exactly how big the bubbles are. And once we count the number of bubbles too, we'll convert this into a volume so you know how many bubbles per unit volume here that you're actually getting. Now. In this case, I'm going to turn the aerator on, it will settle down, and it will settle down to a constant blood bubble flow rate. Here come the bubbles now. Now with a video recording, you can pause this at any time you think is representative of the average number of bubbles, and count the average number between these markers. And then you should also be able to use the scale on here with a paused recording to get some sort of idea of the diameter of the bubbles as well. And we want you to record those measurements in your prank book. 
So the size of the bubbles and how many they are between the two markings on average. And look at different parts of the recording to ascertain what those values are. Okay. So this is bubble aeration experiment on the red fluid. So again, we're looking at the number of bubbles that are occurring between these two markers. Here, once the fluid settles down, it's producing a constant amount of bubbles. You will see some dynamics like bubbles merging, but look for a representative average of your average bubble size and the average density between these two markers. So to assist you in bubble size, here again is a ruler and hopefully you can use that scale there to ascertain exactly how big the bubbles are in this viscosity fluid. Okay. Okay, good. Alright, this is bubble experiment number three on the yellow fluid. So the aerator has already been put in and reached equilibrium. And again, we want to count the number of primary bubbles coming from the aerator between these two marks. There are a lot of smaller secondary bubbles in this fluid now. And to aid you in measuring the bubble size, I'm gonna put a scale up here next to it to give you some sort of indication of what the average bubble diameter is of these rising bubbles. Again, some emerging, but try and get an indication of the size of the primary bubbles using the scale on the ruler. Don't use this scale, that's in mils. Use this scale. All right, once you've worked out the average bubble size and the average number of bubbles between these two markers, we write those in our prank books and we'll move on to the four on the blue viscosity liquid. This liquid has some bubbles in it already which are clouding it up, which you can see, but hopefully you can see the bubbles rising up part the way there. So to assist us seeing this, we might actually hold this up so the window and see if that helps you see the bubbles moving up through the fluid now as these lighter colored blobs mm -hmm. that will give you an assistance in counting the bubbles between here and here and then lastly again we want to try and measure the bubble size so we use a ruler for scale and try and get some sort of indication of the size of these lighter bubbles through the glass against the scale of the ruler. And I'll hold this head. Come out the floor. Does that help there? All right, so count the number and the size of those bubbles. I'll leave this on a little bit because they're a little hard to see in this fluid. And then, once you've got those numbers, your average diameter there, and the average number you see in this interval here, write those down in your prac book against the blue fluid, and that's what we're going to graph up next. Olympus Mons. It's on Mars, on the fastest vault, which is the biggest volcano in the solar system. And it is a shield volcano, meaning the lavas that come out of it generally are quite runny. And at the moment, I've got running through it some low viscosity fluid, i.e. water, which I'm connecting via a pipe. Now let's see what happens when we increase the pressure of the water coming through. I wonder how high we can get. Oh, I'm starting to get a bit wet, it's spraying everywhere. Alright, we have a lava fountain of water about to flood the lab. I have managed to hit the roof before, but I'm slightly concerned where this is going. Alright, the main point with water is that it flows rapidly downhill. It doesn't build up and build big slopes of topography. 
Much like basalt lava, it actually flows fairly smoothly and forms these low-lying shield volcanoes. Uh, alternative to that, though, is a highly viscous magma, and for this, I'm just going to reuse one of the fluids we had going before. And I've learned my lesson of trying to run this to erupt through the hole. It's too viscous to do so, but if we pull a bit in, the thing that you notice immediately is the topography of the lava around the edges is very steep. It's formed a very thick flow in comparison to the water we had running through there. And it tends to build up quite a lot of slope because it is so viscous and it doesn't flow very well. It tends to form quite a lot of slope. And if we made a volcano out of a much more viscous material like this, that it'd have a lot more serious topography. It wouldn't form this low shield shape. It'd form this very chunky, built up, very steep sided volcano. And now, just purely to keep the giggles going, I'm going to run water through it once more and see if we can wash away the viscous slope with basalt lava. All right, here we go. I'm not only cleaning my volcano, but we're looking at two different lavas interacting. And again, just for comparison, the amount, the thickness of the basalt layer you build up, and in this case, the water layer on the slope is very thin compared to the thickness of the glucose syrup layer we built up, which is a much thicker magma. Shall we try through the roof? Yes, we shall. Turning up the water right now. Everyone, I give you a little moment. I'm just sad you're in class this evening. 